economy is anyways confusing for everyone but right now i think it's safe to say that we are in a period of chaos there's a lot of instability on a global level we're not sure where this is going to take us so what do we need to know about the changing financial environment and where does financial security come into it what sort of meaning it holds in today's world so that's a big that's a lot that's a um <laughs> i you know I, i'm not sure i'd use the word chaos i think okay, okay. you know when we're almost wherever you are it never feels very good and it always feels uncertain and i you know used to manage money professionally in mutual funds i did that for 30 years and it's funny because in hindsight you could look back and go well that was easy or hard but at the time it always just felt hard so i will say that it feels really chaotic now and i think that's true it, it feels very uncertain our interest rates going to go down that's something we're focusing on in the us right now as we're recording this talk um you know unemployment hasn't started picking up but certainly it's harder to find a job and certainly if you're in your 20s and 30s 3 years ago right coming out of the pandemic you could just get a job by you know like blinking right people were ghosting potential employers right it was all amazing if you were young and wanting to work hard you know it's not like that anymore it's a lot harder and i think there are some layoffs happening and certainly white collar jobs are for the first time in a long time seeing a lot of stress so Yeah it's it it feels scary out there for sure. Um it seems like right I'm not going to I have no information that you can't read in the newspapers but it does not seem at the moment like the US at any rate is going to fall into a recession uh but it is definitely slowing down a little bit and people talk a lot about the goldilocks scenario right like from the three little bears mama bear papa bear and and, and baby bear and can you get it just right so can we get the economy just right you know that's that's a tall order but so far it doesn't look like anything has gone totally sideways right that doesn't look like there've been any catastrophic mistakes that that the fed has made in the us um i think other governments around the world have their own stresses there've been some elections in the uk right that throws up a lot of uncertainty the us is heading into another election cycle which throws up a lot of uncertainty i think in the us certainly there's very little evidence that says that big changes in in the government right the the congress flipping from democratic to republican or the white house flipping from democratic to republican actually doesn't typically have that big an effect on the economy um so while it's easy to emotionally get really wrapped up in what's going on i think in terms specifically in the us right because of the divided government that that we have right now it's pretty hard to have a a shift in the white house or a shift in congress actually totally change the landscape i would i would note that that is not true in the uk um that might not be true in other countries around the world uh where parliamentary systems i think typically especially if there's a change in government right have a much bigger ability to affect some pretty substantial changes that's not true in the us so for any americans listening right i wouldn't i wouldn't be making economic decisions based on political uncertainty right i think that's that's a lot So you asked a question about what can we do to increase financial stability. I think first and foremost um taking a big deep breath and saying, you know what? It's going to be fine. I think broadly speaking that is true. I think when we can lengthen, you know, we we'd like to talk in economics about time horizons, right? I think it's a, it's easy to feel a lot of uncertainty around today or tomorrow or next week or next month but when we stretch a little bit and this does get easier the older you are but if you stretch a little bit and look out 5 years 10 years things tend to feel a little less uncertain a little more stable and that's just because you can look back and see that yeah there were these bumps and there there was economic things and you know my husband got laid off and he thought you know i mean stuff happens but over time right most people kind of muddle through just fine so number 1 take a deep breath number 2 it's really important to have a plan b and maybe a plan c when it comes to your money so what does that mean uh i think first and foremost it means focusing on building up an emergency savings fund so that you can weather a 3 to 6 month shock as we say let's say a job loss or a really big expense that you weren't planning on like a major car repair or a major house repair 
uh, or a spouse losing a job, right, or a big health issue, right? Those are all things that can really um, cause uh, a lot of financial and emotional distress. So if you haven't already done this, please, please, please start saving into an emergency savings fund. Fund Again, the typical advice is three to six months of necessary living expenses. That means throw out going out to eat, throw out vacations, you know, throw out buying new clothes. Like what do you need to stay in your house and stay fed and keep up on your minimum loan payments, right? That's what we're talking about with minimum living expenses. So number one is really what's the most important thing people can do to, to manage financial instability and to create a feeling of stability is to start building up that emergency savings fund. I think I often like this comes up with my friends a lot, people who are in, in their 30s. We often wonder if we feel like there's so much instability, there's so much fear because we have never been this age before. Like when you're younger, you don't really care so much about all of this. You don't have responsibilities. You're not worried. So maybe we are more sensitive because we understand more. And obviously the news channels, they're always so ominous in their warnings some to some extent for their ratings, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, so it makes sense what you are saying. And that seems to be the mindset to work with, you know, panicking never helps anybody. So thank you for that advice. Um, I have to ask like financial stability. I think that means different things for different people. Just from the, from the, you know, so far as mindset is concerned, so far as peace of mind is concerned, if you can create an emergency fund, as you said, can that allow you to feel financially stable or do other fail safe or do other plans have to be in place for you to reach that place of certainty where you, you feel like, okay, I have some financial security in today's world? I think the emergency savings fund is the minimum that you need to really have that feeling of financial security. And, and I'll be honest, I'm not sure everybody necessarily can attain financial, that feeling of financial security. And I know a lot of people who grow up in very um, financially insecure environments. And actually, my mother would be one of them, right? Her father was a chronic gambler. And, you know, my parents, she's 90 years old now, and uh, or will be uh, next year, and are very financially secure. And I don't think she feels it in her soul. Because she grew up with a father who was gambling his money away periodically. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty and stress for her growing up. Um, I think I inherited a little bit of that from her, right? I, I certainly grew up in a very stable family. And I certainly, you know, have been lucky enough to be in an industry and in a job that that has let me earn uh, a, a very good living. But I think it's it's tough to ever say, I know I'm fine. And that's because we don't actually know what the markets will do, and we don't actually know how long we're going to live. So there is some fundamental uncertainty around this. Like there's some unknowable things that make it, again, really hard to feel really secure. So so the way I break that down is, you know, A, have that, you know, emergency, like what happens if I lose my job and I have no income coming in for six months? What do I do then? Um, and then you start thinking about the things you can layer into that, right? Something I urge people to think about, and it, it's a great thing to think about when you're not under stress, right? When you can are in a better place to make decisions. But a great thing to think about is, you know, what would I do if my income changed? What would I start cutting? How much discretionary spending am I doing versus spending I have to do, right? So a house, especially in this economy, is something people have stretched for. When you stretch for a house, and, and I get that people are doing it now, you don't create much wiggle room for yourself in terms of your budget, right? So again, it's easy to say, no, don't do it, but it's hard to do. So if you are stretching for your house or your housing, boy, make sure you're not also stretching to afford a really fancy car, Make sure you're not also stretching to take a fancy vacation. Like you really need to think about the, the level of spending that you're locked into and, and how much wiggle room you have. So how, what, where can you start cutting without uh, needing to move or sell your car, right? Those, those, are not good, those are not good strategies in the short term. You may get there, but like, let's not start there. So I think for long-term financial stability, stability feeling confident that your income is going to be higher than your expenses 
<laughs> in a predictable way is really important. So there, so there's, a, there's some things you can do kind of in a planning stage as you're, especially if you're in your, let's say twenties and thirties, you know, you, you may have been adulting for 10 or 15 years, but you've still got a long way to go. So here's some things that can really help. Like you know, a big, a big thing that I tell people is commit to saving half of every raise. So if you get a 5% raise this year or a 10% raise, if you're lucky, make sure you put two and a half percent of that or 5%, right? Half of whatever that is into savings. And that will stop you from doing lifestyle or consumption creep because that's what really gets people right you just start out you're not earning very much money you get that first big raise and you're like oh boy i can afford to do x or y or z and then you get another raise and you're like Whoo, now i can actually afford to move into an apartment where i'm not like sharing a bathroom with five people this is awesome right and so you keep spending more and more money and you know the first couple of years like i get it but you gotta you can't keep doing that that's the way to never achieve financial stability or that feeling of security because you never catch up. And what you're doing is you're creating a sense of always needing more to be happy, but it's not going to make you any happier in the long run, right? There's tons of research that shows us that once we hit a certain sort of basic level of comfort, getting a bigger house or a fancier car or a nicer vacation doesn't actually make us feel any better. So, it's important to set yourself up for success long term by not creating that it's called the hedonic treadmill. But you you don't want to put yourself on that with your income because if anything happens to your income, you're in big trouble. And even if nothing happens to your income, you're you're creating a lifestyle that requires a huge amount of cash to to fuel and and it's very difficult to save enough to maintain that, you know, in retirement or for the rest of your life. So it's better not to set yourself up for that. So if you're saving half of your raise, you will also very quickly finding yourself building up not just an emergency fund and not just your retirement fund, but like a, hey, if I want to take six months off, I can fund. Or, hey, I want to buy a nicer house or remodel my house. You've got the money saved up, right? So it's a great way to build in that cushion. And most people in most economies get pretty consistent raises until they're in their late 30s or sort of mid mid 40s. And then it kind of stops happening. So you know your wages kind of plateau. So it's a really good habit to get into in your 20s and 30s. There's one question that I have to ask. We get very like different advice on this subject. We keep trying to understand whether we should be buying a house or not or whether should we should be oh. renting a house like this comes up so much and there's so much confusion yeah. around it okay so it depends on where you are just for starters and i don't just mean countries although that also matters but also like literally the town and the community where you're living some are relatively ex more expensive some are relatively less expensive and it also depends on the way your housing market works right in the u.s conventional wisdom would say that if you don't know that you are certainly going to stay where you are for at least five years, um, it probably does not make sense to buy because we have to pay a lot of closing costs in the US, right? So their fees to the real estate agent, their registration fees, their title fees, um, and those fees alone can chew up a lot of, you know, like two or three or 4% or 5% or 6% of the price of your home. So if you assume that in a normal economy, the price of a house typically over the very long term, I'm talking 20, 30, 40 years, typically goes up at the rate of inflation, right? That's typically how much housing costs. Now in the US, and I think in many, many, many places around the world, especially since the financial crisis in 2008, we just haven't been building enough houses. And that in some, again, this is why it's so location specific, in some locations that predated by, you know, two or three decades, the financial crisis, but certainly in this, in the US, and I think in many other countries, certainly in the UK, I think in Ireland as well, I don't know so much about some other places around the world like India, but certainly in many places, there's just not enough housing. So that makes the price go up more, right? Supply and demand, the more of something you have, the cheaper it is, the less you have, the more expensive it is. That's happening right now with, with housing. Interest rates are also hurting because interest rates have gotten very high, relatively speaking. Now, when I was a kid, interest rates were three, four times as high as they are now for mortgages. So, you know, relatively speaking, in the arc of history, mortgage rates are not super high, but certainly compared to what they were five years ago, they are super high. So it makes the monthly 
fee that you're paying to buy really expensive. All of that said, it is going to take a really long time, right? Decades probably for the housing imbalance to kind of sort itself out. So I'm not really worried that prices are going to suddenly start falling like crazy, but there are a couple of factors out there that may make housing, again, in some places around the world, a little less expensive going forward. And one is baby boomers selling their houses and downsizing. The problem is they're taking cash and buying houses right now, and that's actually not helping because they're moving somewhere, right? And so they're taking another apartment. But but at some point, they're actually going to be exiting the housing market permanently, shall we say. We're not there yet, but that's that, that'll help a little. It's a little grim. Um, interest rates going down will help a little bit on the monthly payments, but interest rates going down may also want to make more people buy. So I'm not sure that that's really going to be the magic cure for everything. Um, so I think it really boils down to, do you think you want to stay somewhere for five years or not? And, you know, do the math, you know, how much can you rent? I, I suspect rents will stop. And, and I think in a lot of markets, they've stopped increasing like, like crazy. Like a couple of years ago, they were going up a lot. I think I've seen certainly where we live um, in New Jersey, right? Rents have stopped going up and they're even coming down a little bit. And that's because there's new supply coming in for sure. Multifamily housing is being built around the town I live in. And it's, it's, I think really going to push prices down on rents. Um, they're being built to rent though, not to sell. So I don't know that that's going to help the people who want to buy. So I think you have to do the math. You have to decide from a lifestyle perspective, right? Are you committed to staying in this place for at least five years, right? Because it's going to be expensive to buy and sell and prices don't always go up. So what are you going to do if the price goes down? You might think, oh, that'll never happen, but it happened to a lot of people in 2008. And it took them a long time to get back to, to the level that they were at before. So you might get trapped in your house, basically. So number one, are you going to stick around? And then number two, right, you know, there's a saying that you can be house poor, right? Like how much are you willing to sacrifice of your current consumption to be able to buy something? You know, do you want to give up on the vacations? Do you want to give up on being able to dine out? Do you want to give up on being able to do, you know, X, Y, Z that you may have gotten used to? I know when we bought our house, we, well, I was also, we were just had our first child. Like we stopped spending money on everything, right? Except diapers, right? It was just like, whoop, that was done. You know, we were done. Um, so I think you have to have a really, and this maybe is a broader theme, right? You need to get curious about where you're spending your money and where it brings you satisfaction. And how important it is to you to have that sense of ownership. It is not always a good financial decision. It just isn't. And I, I think shame on people who say you should always, because you, there's no should always with housing, right? It really depends on your situation and where you are in life, but also where you are physically. Yeah, there is so much to it. Like I have uh, spent past two years planning and so that was the first time in my life where I actually sat down with bank. Uh, managers with uh, financial advisors and actually spoke to them about this subject and I found out so much there is so much there that you have to learn and consider before you make that decision so you are absolutely right anybody who says that you have to do this or this is the way to go I don't think that's true you are absolutely right it will there are so many considerations I think there are only two things that I would say are absolutes with money right one is you need to save. Like, not saving is wrong, period. The second thing is for long term goals, not for your emergency savings fund, but for long term goals, you cannot afford to leave your money sitting in cash. You have to invest it. And in different economies and different countries, that might mean slightly different mixes of things. But broadly speaking, certainly in the Anglo Saxon world, right, it means buying some stocks, right? And investing for the long term. And those are the only two things that you should do. Everything else, you know, is going to be some flavor of it depends a little bit on your specific goal on your time horizon, right? How long you lock the money up for, um, and a whole bunch of other factors. But the housing one drives me crazy. Like I don't I don't think if you don't think you're going to stay somewhere a long time, buying is probably a bad idea. And then you get you get a lot of people are trapped right now, right? They can't move. Like people are unwilling to take new jobs and move because they can't buy a new house if they sell their house because they don't want to change their mortgage rate, right? That's not good. 
Okay, now I have to ask because we talked about saving a chunk of your whatever raise you get, 50% of that raise. That applies to, like, that, that would be an answer meant for some of my listeners. But a lot of the people now are gig workers or they're freelancers. And some of them have are still looking for jobs. Like, it's shocking to me in how many of my last few conversations with my friends, I've had someone who is highly qualified tell me they were laid off. And like you can hear them, the voice shaking on the phone and it's like, fuck, this is not, how are they managing this? Are they okay? And then you can't even bring up, hey, do you have emergency fund? Do you, ha- are you saving? But that's, that's the wrong time to have that conversation. Yeah, right? You absolutely. have to have it before or it's a lesson you learn for next time, but you, yeah. that's the wrong time to ask. Yeah, but absolutely. <laughs> so just talk to me about that. Is this conversation for everyone or is this conversation limited to those who have a certain level of income? I think the emergency savings conversation is for everybody, but you have to be earning income to talk about saving. Like if you, if you are, you know, not earning anything, then it's really hard to talk about saving because it, you know, that's just reality. Um, You know, my younger son is actually a musician and is going to be probably a gig worker for the rest of his life. Right. So we've had a lot of conversations about what that means and, how to think about it. And, you know, one thing he's far more comfortable than I'd be doing, which maybe is why I'm not a musician, is like, you know, being super, super, super cheap about everything um, and being just ruthless about what he's committing to spend money on so that he's got his, you know, sort of mandatory monthly spending just bare bones, right? And then he's got more room, you know, if things are going better, he's got some room, but he's already talking to me about, you know, you know, making sure that emergency savings fund is there, which, which fortunately it is for him. Um, but then like, how does he think about throwing more money into things like retirement accounts where you can't really get the money back out again, right? So for a gig worker, right, let's assume you've got the emergency savings saved up, big assumption. Um, we'll go back to what if you haven't, but let's just say you do, right? To me, the, the decision about how do you get comfortable putting money into something like a retirement fund where it's really difficult to get the money out. In some places, it's impossible. In other places like the US, it is possible, but it's expensive. You pay a big penalty in terms of taxes to, to get that money back. So, you know, I think my advice for, for gig workers, and again, it's easy to say sitting here, um, is you really need to have something like a year saved up in emergency savings. The, the more uncertain your income stream is, whether that's because you're gigging, whether that's just because you're in a super volatile industry like entertainment where you get hired and fired and like, or you're in an industry that's seeing a lot of change like technology, if you're a computer programmer, right, with AI coming online and stuff and, you know, all the overhiring that happened in 2001 and 2002 and some big tech firms, like, like there's just going to be a lot of change in that industry. So the more uncertain the environment seems for you and the longer it is taking people to get hired and you kind of get a flavor for that. You know, you can actually, there's statistics out there published on that, but you also can get a sense for that by just talking to people in your network, the, the more you should be saving. So, and again, this is an easy thing to say, but, but please, please, please do it. If you've got a paycheck coming in, because now's the time to do it. Um, for those people who are gigging who don't have that saved up, right? I think, again, that's where your plan B strategy comes in. Like, what can you cut now? Just what can you stop spending money on? Like, like I think making sure you keep a roof over your head is a big one. Um, keeping up with your insurance payments is a big one because if you miss some insurance payments, your policies get canceled and then you have the catas- catastrophic event with your health or your car or your home. Um, renter's insurance, really important. If you're renting, it's not very expensive. It's really cheap. And that will prevent a whole bunch of terrible things from happening to you. If your roommate leaves the door unlocked, if you're, I had a suitcase disappear once and I got a ton of money back from my renter's insurance to replace stuff. The airline covered like almost nothing. Um, but my renter's insurance covered like everything else in my suitcase. It was horrifying to actually add up how much it would cost to replace everything in a piece of check luggage. It was thousands of dollars. Um, so that kind of a policy does not cost much, but keep up your insurance, keep your roof over your head, keep up with your minimum debt payments, right? Don't worry about paying any balances off. Keep up with those minimum payments and then frankly, cut out everything else. Go to 
name 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 the big box grocery store go to costco go to aldi's like do not be going to whole foods do not be going out to eat like cheap 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 cut off your streaming services maybe not cut off your wi-fi you need that but like really get ruthless um, with with that spending because you just don't know how long it's going to take to find another job. If you've got any vacation plans, cancel them. See if you can resell tickets, right? If you've got a, tickets to the Taylor Swift concert, see if you can resell them. I mean, this is not the time to be to be doing that. Um, it just isn't, unfortunately. And that's that's terrible. It feels terrible. Actually, I would say there's a comfort in it. It's, uh, I am someone who has her own business, someone who is a freelancer. I do, I love doing a variety of things. Um, I love using all my skills. So I love writing. I love podcasting. I love coaching. I also love doing projects that are finance oriented, that are very analytical. I have to say, because some months are really, really good and some months not so much, I have embraced like a very minimalist lifestyle and again uh, as i'm saying this i want my listeners to know no judgment here i don't judge anyone who does things differently absolutely not but because um i have had a lot of privilege growing up my parents are um, fairly comfortable with money so you always have that assurance in the back of your mind uh, that they are you know they, they have properties they are portfolios that sort of thing but just for myself because you don't want to take money from your parents anymore, so you're on your own. It's there is a comfort in the fact that you can you don't need these things to make you happy when you realize that you don't have to splash around your money. And again, I say no judgment because I've never really been someone who has ever really thrown money around. I've only ever really wanted books. <laughs> Unfortunately, those are very cheap. So so no judgment there. But if you can I think there is something to it if you can control your spending because that is the one thing that really sort of like gives you that sense of being out of control. So if you can get control in that way, it's amazing. It feels so good. It feels like you can survive anything. I know it's it uh, sounds a little exaggerated, but it's definitely there. It's, if you can do that, if you can control your lifestyle, I think money stops running you at some point with that. I think... You just said a couple of really important things, right? One of them is not needing to splash around the money to feel happiness, right? And I talked a little bit about that too with the hedonic treadmill and like always needing a better thrill to make you happy. And if you just imagine, like, I really like food, I like eating, I like going out to eat. And it stops being wonderful if you go to a super fancy restaurant. Like, you just get used to it and you're like, all right, here's another nice meal, whatever. And it's like, is that really nice? Like, is that really how you want to feel? Like, there was a video my kids loved watching, my younger son, especially when he was little, like three years old, called um, Elmo Saves Christmas. And for a while, every day was Christmas and nobody enjoyed it. I mean, it's kind of a silly little kids video, but but it's true. It stops being special if it's just your ordinary life. And I do think that we lose, we lose uh, a sense of... Um, wonder in the world if everything is wonderful all the time it becomes meaningless right so i do think that it's easy to become jaded and then you're just always seeking you know more and more and more and more and this is exactly the, the hedonic treadmill right so i think keeping you know getting really curious about what kind of experience or thing makes you really happy right is a beautiful thing we actually spent a fair amount of money well i write about it a lot in my book but we, we live in a money pit and we spend a lot of money fixing it up and we spend a lot of money actually with furniture and things and i have to say it makes me really happy like i'm really happy in my house i'm really happy you know in in our sitting room and it just makes me happy to be in this space so you know did we need to spend all that money absolutely not could we have done it for less money a hundred percent is it making me happy all the time to be in it? Absolutely. Whereas, you know, I realized, you know, despite my just saying I love going out to eat, like another fancy meal, I'm like, eh, it tasted good. Doesn't, doesn't make me happy. I'm just as happy, you know, cooking dinner and eating it on our back porch. So, so for us, that's, you know, get, get curious around what I like to travel um, a lot. and one of the things I always think is helpful to, is to invite people to think about what's their definition of failure with spending money. 
And I used to think about two things with, you know, food and travel, because I thought, well, when I retire, I want to be able to travel and I, you know, want to be able to eat. And I thought, you know, when 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 I had just moved to Italy with my uh, then boyfriend, he had just gotten a job. I didn't have a job. We were we were broke. We were beyond broke. We had absolutely no money. And we had so little money that, and this was back in the 90s when it was really expensive to buy an English language newspaper. There was no internet. You couldn't just look at the news on your phone for free. And and the English language newspapers were really expensive. And we basically could buy one or two English language newspapers a week, or we could buy like meat for the week. So we could buy a chicken or we could buy a newspaper. And we're like, well, okay, some weeks we picked the newspaper, but most of the time we picked the chicken. So I found one on sale and we lived in Milan and I didn't speak very good Italian, but I found a chicken on sale in the grocery store and it looked like, like a chicken. And it was a polo tra- chicken, traditionale, a traditional chicken. And I was like, all right. And I took it home and I unwrapped it and I was going to roast it. And I took the styrofoam off, wrapping off and it had been plucked, but it had its head, it had its feet. And it had not been cleaned inside. Oh, God. So I was like, well, here we go. This thing is not going back to the supermarket because I've unwrapped it. So yeah. we're going to figure out how to clean a chicken. Um, and, you know, I had a cookbook, Joy of Cooking, and, you know, firmly grasping the neck of your chicken in your left hand, carefully reach inside and, right? So, and I was just thinking in the back of my head, my grandmother would just be laughing at me right now, right? But haven't you ever cleaned a chicken? Well, no, grandmother, I haven't. Um so I never want to be that poor again in my life. Like that is too poor. Like never again do I want to have to clean a chicken or I wouldn't eat. Like that's not good. So that's failure for me is being that poor. I used to say that I love to travel, but I don't want to have to share a bathroom. Like I don't want to stay at a youth hostel anymore. Like I'm done with that. I want my own bathroom. So that was my definition of failure. Like I would have, will have failed I would rather go camping and pee in the woods than like have a bathroom down the hall in a hotel, right? So actually, I like to camp. But um, I went on a trip with my girlfriend, uh, my college roommate, a couple uh, uh, years ago, and uh, it was in 2021, I guess. And it's on this little island off the coast of Maine. And we were on this little ferry boat getting out there. And my roommate said, oh, and I'm a little worried you'll find the accommodations very um, kind of not where you're used to and kind of humble. And I said, oh, Sandy, don't be silly. As long as I have my own bathroom, it'll be fine. And there's this really long silence. And she (laughs) says, well, there are five bedrooms sharing two bathrooms. So it's kind of like just the two of us are sharing the bathroom. And I'm thinking, oh, all right. And then she said, I'm just so sorry that they spent all of their pandemic protection money electrifying the guest bedrooms. I really am going to miss the oil lamps. And I was like, all right. (laughs) <laughs> no electricity would have been way too far. <laughs> and I've gone back. Yeah. And I'm going back again next summer. And it was fine. It was lovely. And, you know, whatever on the bathroom, like, it's fine. <laughs> so, but, you know, understanding where your definitions of maybe success is a, like a, like, there's a lot of success. There's a lot of room yeah. for success. Like, but where's your failure point? Because that's the one you really need to pay attention to. What's going to make you feel bad? Yeah, yeah, that's that makes sense, and that that is the definition to work with because I think we need that. We need to understand that so that I think that is the real cushion here, so far as mindset is concerned, at least. And uh, yeah, it it uh, I remember calling up a friend and saying that I'm officially old because I cut back on so many of my spending just so I can put money, uh, like I have investment fund that my father pushed me into. Um, mm-hmm. in, putting money uh, every year in and like it's a lot some and I was like I felt so good when I did that even though it meant cutting like letting go of a lot of my and not traveling that year and I was like I'm officially old because that felt awesome that I was I could I did that that felt (laughs) awesome so I think like you said get curious there's something to it I have to say when I was younger the idea of brown bagging a lunch like on a trip or something would have horrified me it's like oh I'm turning into my mother and now I'm like I wouldn't dream of spending $17 or $25 or whatever for a terrible sandwich out of a refrigerated case at an airport like no I'm gonna bring my own thank you very much um, so part of it's money and part of it's just like, I'm unwilling to, to eat bad food, uh, or, or maybe it's a control thing, but, but like get curious. Right. And then, 
and then you can start working with what's my definition of of failure and then as you say it's all cushioned on top of that right i think that's beautiful i think that's beautiful it's all it's all cushioned on top of that so so back to the gig worker and back to you saying there's some months that they're good and there's some months that are bad right i think after you've been living that life for a cycle and whether that's a year or multi years depending on what you're doing and what industry you're you're in I think you can develop a sense for, okay, January through April are always really good and May and June are always terrible. And then it's really great in July for some reason. Don't know why, but this is the third year. So I'm going to assume that's going to keep happening. Like whatever the the rhythm is, then that may let you um, not completely anchor all your spending on the worst month you ever have, but to actually try to start smoothing that out a little bit. And that's, again, when I say have a year emergency fund for a gig worker, right? Some of that is to be able to actually do what, you know, the technical term is consumption smoothing, Um, but to actually let yourself build up a little bit of a reserve kitty. And maybe you say, okay, I've had three good months in a row. I'm going to let myself spend half of that money. And then if that runs out and my income doesn't go back up, whoop, I go back down to my minimum again. Like there, there are ways of gauging, right? How that works so that you can allow yourself to enjoy a little bit. And I want to make sure people don't lose sight of, you know, money is a means to an end. It's not the end. So it's great to save. It's great to have that investment cushion. But, you know, I also firmly believe that money is a tool to achieve other things. It's not just an objective. So making sure that you're aligning what you're doing with your money, with your personal values and what makes you happy, I think is also really important. In your content you have shared, especially in your books, you've you've talked about hacking your personality, your mindset. Because I think as you were talking about it, I'm sure some of my listeners like itching because it it seems so alien, this behavior of caution seems so alien to a lot of the reckless spenders out there. Is there a way they can, I don't even know if this question makes any sense, but is there a way to work with your personality so that it's not so much of a struggle? I think there are a couple of tricks that you can use. And one is just, again, trying to be curious. And, you know, if you can, right, for a week or a day, just look back on the day before or the week before and and see if you can keep track of where you were spending. And this is where credit cards actually are make it easier, because you can actually see online what you spent your money on. Um, If it's cash, it's a little harder. And just ask yourself, like, do you remember how you felt after you spent the money? And how do you feel now? Um, it, It can be really powerful, again, just to get curious. Um, Automating savings is really powerful. You know, Nobel prizes have been awarded for this, right? The more you can automate your savings, the less you ask yourself to do something that most people feel is painful, which is not do something you want right now for some random future event. That's not even like, who is this weirdo that I'm saving for? Who's like 30 years older than I am? Like, why am I doing that? Um, it, It actually hurts most people to deny themselves something they want today for this, you know, theoretical future. So, so don't make yourself make that decision. Like just do it automatically to have it taken out of your account, have it invested automatically. Every time you ask yourself to make a decision, it's a great place to delay, to do research, to do it tomorrow right? To get paralyzed by indecision because there are too many choices out there. Should I buy stocks today? I don't know. The market just went up. I don't know. It's going down. There's an election. I don't know. Maybe the federal cut interest rates. I should just wait. People get in that place super easily. So again, if you're investing for the long term, 20, 30, 40 years, it doesn't really matter if you invest today or tomorrow. So just do it today and stop worrying about it, right? Take it off your to-do list. So number one, automate, 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 automate. The second thing you can try to do is think of ways to slow yourself down. So if you have an iPhone with Apple Pay on it, maybe take it off your phone so you can't go ding. Right. If you are on Instagram or TikTok and find yourself just tapping on things and buying them, Maybe take your credit card off of there so you can't do that until you look up your credit card and have to type it in. It'll slow you down. And in that moment of slowing down, right, it gives you, you a chance to say, do I really want to do that? What's, what's my goal again? So, so to me, it's like figuring out the places that you can 
slow down to give your rational brain a chance to step in is really important. And I think it's important to know that, uh, you know, I think our nature and nurture both affect the way we are around money. And nature is really the, the behavioral wiring that makes us loss averse or risk averse or have no future, you know, like I would have failed the marshmallow test, right? Where they give a three-year-old a marshmallow and say, if you wait five minutes, you get a second one. I would, I would totally have eaten the marshmallow instantly, right? I just would not wait. <laughs> so I know that about myself now, right? So, so don't, don't make little marshmallow tests for yourself. Like, like just don't do it. So, so slow yourself down. I, I am old enough to remember like when you went shopping, you had to have cash or, yes. or write a check. You had to physically go to the store and find a parking space and go find the thing. And then you had to go to the cash register and either have enough cash in your wallet or go, oh, I don't have any cash. Let me write you a check. Oh, my checkbook. Okay, I can't buy anything. Boom. Um, right. There were a lot of places where that transaction could, could fail. Mm. Right. And today, right, it's just like tap. Yes. So if you're a tapper... Figure out ways to disrupt the tap. I think taking your credit card out of stuff is really effective because then you have to pull it out and actually type it in. And just that much of a delay gives your brain a, a chance to catch up with yourself. Yeah, that's actually super duper true. I have never like considered that because we've been so proud of the fact that India is totally digital now. Nobody carries cash. Like even on the, the roadside vendor has that UPI thing up and you can just digitally pay. And I remember being out with my parents and they bought something something very expensive it was for them it was their purchase and they were they look, pulling out the cash and then the person is like oh uh we are not taking cash and i was like oh please what are you guys doing you're wasting time let me just pay for this and i paid for it and my mom's like what why would you do that this was not your expense now you've paid for it what are you doing and i have never in my life asked like ask them to recompense me for anything. Like if I, it's such a pleasure to spend money on your parent. And I, I didn't want to ask them to recompense me for it. But I was like, okay, maybe next time, don't be so quick to reach for your phone. It's fine if they have to like, it takes a minute for them to make the payment. It's fine. <laughs> so what you said is super true. <laughs> well, and there's a little interesting psychology about your discomfort in the moment, if you don't mind my saying that, right? Like, yeah. why were you so uncomfortable? I uh, will say this, like my parents are like any other parent. They're so awesome. They have taken such awesome care of me my whole life. Never said no to me for anything. Um, that for me, this is my win. Like this, I can get so many accolades, so I can get awards, I can get whatever, and it does not register or hit quite as deep as it does for me to, they don't need me to pay for anything. They don't actually need that at all. But if I can do it, if I can buy them something, I don't know, The it's it feels like, I yes, that is success to me. That is my idea of success. Um, yeah. But don't worry, they always find a way to get that money back to me. All well, exactly. So it it, yeah. it comes or it comes around. No, but it's it's interesting, you know. Like again, I I like the word curious a lot because I think so many people feel shame and fear when they think about money and their finances, and and just just don't want to do, just don't go there, um, and just get curious, like why why is that a thing? Like, why did I grab the check if I was out with friends, if I didn't really think I could afford it? Why was it so painful for me to say, hey, I think we should split this up? Right? I mean, I uh, that's one thing that I think I see a little bit more doing the Gen Zers, you know, like t t maybe 27, 28 and under getting a lot better about just saying, hey, I'm not comfortable spending this kind of money for dinner. Let's pick another restaurant, right? Or how about you guys come over to my house? We'll have a game night instead of going out to dinner again, right? I mean, I think I, I wish people could get more comfortable being a little more transparent about what they're comfortable spending. And I think it's really easy to get sucked into, 
feeling like you have to keep up with people or that there's any shame in saying, I'm sorry, I'm a school teacher. I can't afford to do what you do, Mr. You know, dentist or accountant or whatever, right? Like I just, that's not in my budget. And and it it's like we keep score, right, by whose standard of living is fancier. And it's like, I don't, that, that's such a terrible thing to do for everybody. That is so true. There is something to it, though, because when you, uh, like, we are now in our 30s. So now my friends and I, we have calls where we are actually, we've told each other how much money we have, what sort of finances we have. And we then discuss strategies to start creating well and some of us are not there yet but the when you say it there is something to like it opens up a whole new level of friendship with that transparency like the bond is different like we've got each other's back in a very very real way now and also like when I remember being a student I am a Hindu I'm an Indian uh, so this uh, like I wouldn't eat non-veg on Tuesday I don't eat non-veg at all anymore but back then I wouldn't eat them on certain days of the week Everyone, we would go out, the food would be so expensive and I would have had like one dish. So then eventually I had to say, okay, I'm not paying as much as everyone else does because I'm eating like one thing and it's so little. And it was an awkward moment. But after that, I never had to be anxious about the bill ever for the rest of that year. It's it's hard to have meaningful relationships with people if we are being fundamentally dishonest or ashamed about sharing something. And I guess I I was on a bunch of uh, TV shows and things earlier this summer about weddings and, um, you know, people going to weddings or peeing in people's wedding parties and the amount of money people are spending to it was just an article in the paper I read a, a day or two ago about people spending thousands of dollars if they've been asked to be a bridesmaid, especially um, and you know, my bottom line is friends don't ask friends to go into debt to be in their wedding. Like that's just wrong. And if you don't have the kind of friendship where you can say, I'm sorry, that's out of my budget. I can't do it. If you feel like you can't say that to your friend, then I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to, without judgment, throw right back at you. Are you sure they're a friend? <laughs> like what's your definition of friendship? If you can't say that to somebody or you worry that they'll think badly of you or, make fun of you or shame you, right? Then they're not, that's not my definition of a friend at all. Yeah, I agree. I do have this one question. I think that I got from my listeners actually. So for someone who is investing money, someone who is uh, saving for retirement, but someone who also has debt, maybe housing or maybe student loans, then what would the ratio be here wherein you're sending money to all three funds? So it depends, is my first answer. Um, So here are a couple of very common scenarios, right? So a very common scenario is you are working, if you're in America or maybe the UK or some other countries, right? You get a tax advance, you get tax advantaged investment returns if you're saving in a retirement fund. Maybe you don't pay income tax on it. In America uh, and in the UK as well, I think, um, employers will match what you put in. So if you put in, you know, let's say $5,000 a year or $10,000 a year into your 401k plan, which is America's uh, workplace savings program, your employer might match half of that. So you get another $5,000. So if you are in tax advantage savings, if you're earning interest, you know, in tax free, if you're getting an employer match, it's a really good thing to prioritize that because that's, 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 that's working extra hard for you. Um, if you are investing for yourself and are not getting any particular tax advantage on that, then the way I think about whether I want to invest or whether I want to pay down debt is really by looking at the interest rate you're paying on the debt. And then I'm going to say there's kind of constructive debt and unconstructive debt. So I call constructive debt housing. Maybe you could define student loans this way, that you're investing in something that should appreciate over time. So investing in your education, up to a point, investing in your house, up to a point, right, that's going to be an asset that is going to give you some return. So it's it's not, you know, I'd say investing in a new pair of shoes, not so much because those shoes are going to wear out and you're going to throw them away. So that's just spending. Um, So if you look at the interest rate you're paying, typically, uh, the interest rate on 
typically mortgages, at least in this country, and federally guaranteed student loans is typically going to be below 8%. So if you're going to invest your money in the stock market, like you're probably going to make over time, over the long term, 8% or more. So like you want to look at, you know, what am I thinking I'm going to get from my long term stock investments? And what am I paying in interest rate? You should be aggressively paying off any high interest rate debt as fast as you can. And that typically is credit cards. That's typically non-federally guaranteed student loans. Um, that might be personal loans, car loans, right? Depends on the car loans. Sometimes they're higher, sometimes they're lower. Um, but those are the loans you want to pay off aggressively. And I would say, again, you want to be making sure you're investing if you get like a company match or get tax advantage returns in your savings account, you really want to be making sure you're getting at least the match, like get the match. Then if you've got credit card debt and you're paying 25 or 30% on that, you want to pay that off as fast as you can. Then you want to swing back and start investing more money, but get the high interest rate debt paid off. If you've got a housing loan that you can refinance when interest rates go down, and I think they will be going down very soon, Maybe you don't want to push on paying that off because you'll probably make more money having that money invested in the stock market. That will go up faster than your debt will go down if you pay it off, right? So that's the trade off. How much am I paying for the credit? If it's over seven, eight percent, you want to be focusing on paying it off. Otherwise, just just pay it off on time. Yeah, yeah. That answer gives me comfort. Um, and definitely throw the girl math out. I don't think that works. Oh, girl math. Well, actually, in my book, I talk about the stash, right? How to build your stash. And the first one is um, save for a rainy day. The second one is tax aware savings. Get the match. The third is assess your budget and pay down high interest rate debt. The fourth is stay the course and max out your retirement savings and long term investing. And then the fifth one is have fun. So when you think about where your money's going, right? First, emergency savings. Second, get a company match. Third, pay off the high interest rate debt. Fourth, really start maxing out and getting to, to maybe 15 to 20% saving and investment rate. And then after that, it's yours to have fun with. I think that's, that is doable. I think at least this conversation is taking you in a direction where it becomes doable for you. So I, I really appreciate that. Smart investment strategies, like... Because I think young professionals who are just beginning to make some decent amount of money get really uh, turned around when it comes to where do we invest. Like I, um, I, I heard that like you are advising people to invest in stocks, but there are also cryptocurrency. There's other sorts of digital assets that you can invest in. What would your advice be? So I'm kind of boring and old fashioned. Um, I spent 30 years managing other people's money. Uh, I won awards for it. Like, you know, this is, um, and it kind of boils down to a couple of really simple rules. One is if you can't explain what you're investing into your grandmother, don't do it. <laughs> right. Okay. So explain to me why crypto is always going to go up. Is there an answer to that? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. So it may go up. It may keep going up. Like, I, I don't know. I, I personally think it's a bubble, but, you know, I've been wrong before. But if I can't tell myself a story about why it should keep going up in value, I, I don't invest in it. So, you know, I put commodities in general in that bucket, right? Gold, silver, orange juice futures, right? Commodities, um, things that are traded on an exchange. You can make money. It's a very technical thing to make money trading commodities, but it's very risky. And people, you know, they swing around a lot. Like same thing with foreign currencies, right? You see ads on TV or on the internet for trading foreign currencies. Those, those suckers go up and down all the time for really, really random reasons. And again, I used to, there was a year that I basically ran a currency hedge fund and I, I made some money, but boy, you, you know, you're glued to a screen paying attention, you know, when the markets are open and, you know, like, you know, toothpicks in your eyeballs, not to miss anything kind of a thing. And it's, it's not for the faint of heart. I, I think for most people, most of their money should be invested in a long-term diversified strategy. The younger you are, the more stocks you should have, and you should just leave it alone. It's really boring. Uh, it'll go up between seven and ten percent 
annually over time, not every time, but over time. And that means your money will be doubling every seven to 10 years. Just leave it alone. Now, if you find this stuff really interesting and exciting, and like some people like building fantasy football teams, and some people like, you know, geeking out on sports scores, and some people like geeking out on sourdough bread, and you want to geek out on day trading cryptocurrency, like go for it, but only do it with a little tiny bit of money that you can afford to lose. And if you make some money, take your profits off the table like a good person. You know, there, there are people who make money in Las Vegas. They're very systematic. The trick to making money in high risk investments is to be systematic about it, to decide how much you're going to lose and don't lose more than that. And then when you make some money to take your winnings off the table, maybe not all of them, but systematically, like let's say you invest in, in something and it doubles. Take half of what you make out. Maybe don't take all of it out if you want to, if you think it's going to keep going up, but take some money off the table. The easiest thing to do in investing is to look back and go, oh, if only I'd left all of my money there, I would have, okay, what about all the things that if you'd left your money and you would have lost everything? Like we don't remember the bad ones, we only remember the good ones. So having a system and, and systematically we would call it harvesting your gains, right? Being methodical about that, I think is one of the keys to becoming wealthy long-term. That's why rebalancing your portfolio is so important. If you have, you know, I'm a big advocate for just buying uh, things like target date funds, which I used to run or a balanced fund where somebody is doing all of that work for you. If you want to do it yourself, that's great, but please be systematic and If you're managing your own investments, your birthday is a great day to rebalance your portfolio. And rebalancing means selling what's done really well and buying what's not done very well. And that swings you back into balance. If you invested a portfolio in half stocks and half bonds five years ago, probably you'd have a lot more in stocks right now because they've gone up a lot more. You want to pull what you've gained out, put it into bonds, bring yourself back into 50-50. That way you're locking in those gains and systematically staying on top of what's happening. And and there's a lot of research that shows that doing that once a year, there are a whole bunch of different ways you can do that. But basically doing it once a year over time, people have much better results than if they don't do that at all. I've invested in crypto, but I always be like, I'm not hungry enough for this because this is going to give me an ulcer. It, it worries me so much. People don't pay enough attention to the cost of things in non-financial terms. How much energy are you spending worrying about this? How much emotional drag is it on your whole psyche, right? I used to really worry about, you know, I used to get some of my compensation every year in stock. And then I'd be like, oh, should I sell it? I don't know. And I would waste so much time trying to just pick the exact. And I just, this is ridiculous. Like, A, it's not that much money. So it doesn't really matter that much. And B, like, why am I spending all this time, you know, agonizing over this thing? I could just just have a process to sell a quarter of it every month and then it'll be gone and then I'll stop worrying about it. Like, you know, there, there are ways of just setting up processes to automate a lot of this stuff or put some rules around it so that the emotional and intellectual tax that you're paying is lower. And so I think For most people, unless you really enjoy it and are being ruthlessly honest about keeping track of your performance versus a benchmark, and you're good at it, so you have to enjoy it and you have to be good at it and you have to be honest about it. If all those three things are true, then go for it. But I'm going to guess that's maybe 10% of the people or 5% of the people. The rest of us, myself included, who used to do this for a living, just make it go away because it's probably not worth the effort and the emotional energy that you will spend. Yeah. People who are, you know, beginning to make some money where they're starting to consider, you know, where should I invest? How should I save? Where would you direct them to? Like, how can they educate themselves? How can they learn? And what should be they learning that would help them really up their game? I think most people would be very well served by buying index funds Um, Again, there are active managers, I used to be one of them, that can add value over time, but finding them, doing the research to find them, and then having the patience to invest in them, right, is something that I think is best left to professionals. But if you want to do this for yourself, I think um, NerdWallet is a great place to start learning, Investopedia. Um, There are a bunch of other resources out there that are just sort of 
basic education. Um, I'm a big uh, fan of, um, no, I'm going to, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some books that you can put in the chat afterwards. I don't want to try to do this off the top of my head. They're all in my bookshelf back there, but you know, they're just a couple of really, really good basic, like this is how the markets work stuff. But again, I would urge most people to not take all of their money and try to buy five individual stocks. That's a great way to, to blow yourself up. Um, I would really urge most people to put the bulk of their money and by bulk, I mean like 80 to 90% of it in something somebody else is managing, whether it's an index fund, a balance fund, a target date fund, right? That have mixes of different kinds of things, domestic stocks, international stocks, large cap, small cap bonds, right? You want your money spread around a bit. The younger you are, the more you want in stocks. If you're in your 20s or 30s, maybe 70 or 80% in stocks is a good idea. For money that you want in the next five years, let's say you're saving up for a down payment, don't put that in stocks. Please put that in bonds or a CD, a certificate of deposit. You don't want to risk losing any of that money. Right? So the shorter your time horizon is, the more conservative you should be with that money. If you know you need that money next month, it should totally be in your savings account. It should not be anywhere else. <laughs> so, so understanding how to think about, I call it right sizing your risk for your time horizon and your own emotional you know, capacity to live with losses is a very important part of becoming an investor. And as you're learning that about yourself, Right, I would be uh, strongly encouraging of people not trying to bite off everything at once and to find little baby ways to start learning. And so, for most people, I think like a target date fund. If you're in the U.S. or in the U.K., I don't know if India or other markets have similar things, but like a sort of mix of stocks and bonds, to me is you know fifty fifty sixty forty sixty percent stocks forty percent bonds fifty fifty. If you don't know what you're doing and are not sure, but you think it's more than five years, that's a really good place to start. And then read up on, they'll send you reports. You can look online, go to a, a no cost broker, right? Go to a name brand. Like I know a lot of people feel like those big financial services firms are just trying to rip me off, but there's a lot of protection in going with a recognized national brand. Um, and there's a lot of regulation involved. So if they do do something stupid, <laughs> somebody will figure it out and you'll get your money back. So if you're just starting out, I would stick with sort of the name brands. I would stick with, uh, a no fee brokerage type account. And I would try to buy broadly diversified, right? In the US, it would be the S&P 500, right? The 500 largest companies is a very typical thing to invest in or something called the Russell 2000. Russell is the name of the firm that builds the index. It picks the 2000 stocks. That's why it's called Russell or S&P is Standard & Poor's. It's the name of the firm that builds the index that people are copying, right? So those indices are large caps and small caps. There are uh, international right, stock portfolios uh, or global stock portfolios, and every major firm offers a version of these funds, and those are great places to start with low fees. And in this uh, conversation, I have to ask, how much should people rely on social media or podcasters for their financial advice? Because very like recently, not recently, maybe in the last couple of years, I think it happened, in India, the government, like, really called uh, to the table all the people who were dishing out advice through podcasts. I think they were slapped on the wrist. They were told to be, I don't know. I don't know the whole story, but they were like the, the government regularized them. That hasn't happened in the U S I think you just have to be smart about it. And, you know, when I look at what's on social media, I'd say set, maybe 60% of it is really sound, really sound advice, maybe 70% of it. I'd say somewhere between five and 15, depending on where you're living. There are some places like the whole game stonk thing, right? Or just kind of like, you know, some channels, I guess, are very, very, very extreme. So I'd say maybe five to 10% of the stuff I've seen out there in my mind is criminal. And those people ought to be arrested and shut down, except they're not licensed. So they're just, you know, you, you know you, they can say whatever they want. I think in India, probably they, they were like, yeah, you can't say whatever you want. In the US, pretty much. You know, unless you are, uh, there's a paper trail that they can say you're doing what's called a pump and dump scheme, which I think a lot of crypto people do, right? Where you're pumping something up to make everybody all excited about it. And then when everybody gets excited and starts buying it, you dump or sell. Um, I, I think I, the rule of thumb I use, again, is can you explain it to your grandmother? Because if you can't, don't do it. The second one is if anybody is using all caps, 
and must and should and hurry and language like that, that is a really big red flag. Like I said, I think there are two absolutes, like you have to save and you have to invest for the long term. Don't leave your money in cash for, for the long term. Other than that, like there are everything else is some flavor of it depends, right? Like what I just said about how to think about investing, I qualified everything If you're in your 40s or your 30s and you don't need the money for five years, you want to think about this broad, like, did I tell you to buy X or Y or Z? No, because that's, you can't give people that specific kind of advice without knowing something about their specific situation, their risk tolerance, and their ability to understand the advice you're giving them, right? This is, you know, I'm not a licensed, you know, securities professional anymore, but I got to say that the training that we go through if you are a licensed professional with a with a license from you know any regulated body is pretty pretty fierce um and i think it's important to look at the source of information and to think about why they would be saying something so something i hear a lot from from my my community is you know i don't trust the big banks um they're just trying to sell me stuff but the people on social media are my peers and they know what i'm going through so i can trust them and i always think how do you think they're making money like they're getting money with clickbaity sorts of things and the headlines as you said at the beginning of our conversation right with the social you know with the newscasting that's making everything sound really scary and you know extreme so they're getting eyeballs okay so they're making money or they're doing a pump and dump, right? And that, and like I said, 70 to 80% of the stuff is good. I just think you need to be, you need to try to figure out what <laughs> what's in it for them um, and where their benefit is coming from. Like I'm trying to sell books. That's why I do this stuff, right? I want you to buy my book and read it. That's what I'm in, in for. But you know, what? what's their economic model? How are they getting paid? And what's their background? What's their training, right? Why, why are they an expert? This is good advice because this is why I love your book. And I know now that a lot of people share that sentiment with me uh, because there are there's a lot of like information sources that fire you up that are like that sort of put you on like you're standing on a cliff sort of that they create that sense in you. Your book was very different with that in that it grounded me. It made me it gave me some sense of peace. It was like, OK, this is doable. I can do this let's take it one step at a time and then I um, reached out to other people who've read your book they had the same feeling like that was that's a shared sentiment towards your book and I'm not saying this because I'm you know it's your book but I'm saying this because there is it's very real this thing about somebody lighting a fire in you in a in a way where you, you have to act now that's a very bad thing it's very dangerous with almost any financial decision, whether it's, um, you know, somebody who's trying to talk me into buying a service, right? That, that there, you would not believe the number of services out there you can buy for people who are trying to like be influencers or get on podcasts, right? And, and he's like, well, can you sign this today? And I'm like, Whoop, nope, <laughs> done. The second you said that, I'm out, <laughs> right? I'm just out. Like that's a high pressure sale. That's no, I don't want to do business with you. Even if it's a good deal, I don't want to do it because I don't want to, I don't want a high pressure partner. I do talk a lot in my book about some of the brain science. And sadly, the marketers and the people that are good salespeople have intuitively figured this stuff out, even if they haven't like gone and done all, read all the research. They kind of know what works, how to push your buttons. And I think we're all vulnerable, right, to people um you know, manipulate is such a negative word, but um, understanding, right, how to get us to do certain things or to provoke a certain response, right? It's just, you know, some people are really good at it. And I think anybody who is making you feel like it would be inappropriate to ask a question or make you feel stupid for asking a question or uh, putting you under pressure to make a decision, right? Those are clear, clear, clear red flags to me. And, and you know, I like to say there are no stupid questions when it's your money because it's your money. There are no stupid questions. And anybody who makes you feel stupid is not a person you should be dealing with. Okay, so for my last question, I just wanted to know, like a lot of uh, the millennials and the Gen Zers are of the mindset that we want to retire early but obviously they want to have a good retirement. I think it's called the FIRE movement. 
financial, yeah, financial independence, retire early. I think it's great. Like fi fire, right? If you are a diehard fire adherent, right? Some people are trying to save 50 or 60% of their income. The idea is you try to live on $40,000 a year, you save up a million dollars, and then you can live on the 4% rule, which says you can spend 4% of that million dollars, which is $40,000, and then keep the money invested and increase what you spend by inflation, and it should all work out. So I think there are a couple of problems with that formula, like number one being the 4% rule doesn't work if the markets go down three or four years in a row at the beginning, like it's a terrible idea. Um, number two, I think it's really hard for people to live on $40,000 a year. It's not impossible. A lot of people do it, but it's hard work. And I think, again, this goes back to understanding what and why, you know, why you want to achieve something. And if you want to retire early because you hate your job, my invitation would be to get really curious about why don't you just look for a new job? Like, like retirement may or may not be the answer. Um, like maybe you just hate your job because they're bad people or it's a bad culture or it's a bad fit or you really hate XYZ profession and like need to, to find something different. Um, the thing that I think is fabulous about fire is that it really encourages people to save aggressively and to stay off that hedonic treadmill and whether or not you're able to do it at age 40 or 35 or 50, like whatever the age is, the more you save, the more choices you'll have. And those choices could be taking a sabbatical. They could be pivoting and, and moving into a really different career that doesn't pay as well. Um, it could be uh, retiring early. It could be feeling comfortable about gigging and freelancing and consulting because you don't need that steady paycheck in the U S sadly health insurance is always a thing like <laughs> that makes working for an employer really attractive. But I think fire as a philosophy of staying off that hedonic treadmill about being mindful of, you know, increasing your savings rate as your, as your income goes up. I think that's phenomenal. I do think that there is a big backlash among some people who try it because it's just kind of not fun you know, like, again, I think money is a means to an end and not an end. So like, if you're not enjoying spending it, then why are you bothering to earn it? Like, I, I, I find extreme fire kind of joyless. And I think the risk is that it provokes a big backlash. And it's like me trying to, you know, go on a super restrictive diet, and then I just go crazy and like eat a package of cookies, like that, that didn't help anybody, right? That's not a good outcome. So I think it's it's important to understand, again, to get curious about your own reaction to being asked to constrain or sacrifice. And, you know, sacrificing is fine, but if you're suffering, that's not okay. So, like, where's that line? It's something I, I uh, maybe one last little anecdote before we wrap. Um, I'm still working on building the muscle even after all these decades of allowing myself to be uncomfortable when I don't buy something I want because it makes me uncomfortable. And I was saying to somebody like, I just can't stand the, the, the discomfort. And, and they said, well, think about it like being on, in the middle seat on a long airplane flight. I'm like, wow, that's awesome. Like I would never voluntarily <laughs> choose the middle seat on a long flight. Like, no, have I occasionally ended up there? Yes. Is it survivable? Yes. Is it uncomfortable? Yes. Is it intolerable? No. Absolutely not. Do I even remember what it felt like, you know, 15 minutes after I get off the airplane? No, it's gone, right? So it's uh, it's just a like there are ways of helping yourself frame some of these things that give you a a little bit of a coping strategy. And like I said, it's totally a work in progress for me. Like I would have eaten all the marshmallows, right? Can I live with the discomfort of not eating the marshmallow is my, is my perpetual challenge. Right. So, and then I think, well, I can live with the middle airplane seat. You know, my grandmother used to say, uh, will it matter a hill of beans in 20 years? And I'm like, that's another good question to ask yourself. So we've reached the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching and for sharing your time with me. The video description will have the link to all the resources mentioned during the conversation. And if you would rather listen to these episodes, then you can find Experimental Podcast on most podcast platforms. 
If you enjoyed the video, please do share your thoughts in the comment section. And if you want to watch more, subscribe to the channel, please, and do hit the notification bell. I will see you again in the next video. Till then, please do take care of yourself. Bye.